Hi, good night, everybody. Uh, as Prof said, I'll be presenting on our journal paper that got published last month. And it was based on work we did with Nicholas Hussein and his new company, Venzi. I think we did most of the work that started this in around, I think, 2020, uh, when he was just starting off the company. And it was about this, basically a marketplace for events. And the big question he had at the time was, what's the best way for us to help people form those groups for the events, the private events, so that is. So first, just to go through the agenda, uh, we'll introduce the specifics of the problem, then look at some related work, how our approach compared to that and why we did it. Uh, the, a brief overview of the key components of the resulting framework from our approach, how we evaluated it, uh, a couple of examples of other applications that can benefit from this work, and lastly, ways or routes for future work. So whether it's a private event or a study group or recruiting for a company, when you're trying to create a meaningful small group for some specific thing, things can get pretty difficult once you've exhausted your existing friends. At the time when we began this, the pandemic was hindering a lot of in-person events more than they are now. But even if in-person event, in events are possible, the problem still exists because, you know, if you're in a class with uh, people for a, the same subject or if you're attending some conference who you meet still has an element of randomness to it and those people may not align as perfectly as someone else could for your group you might also think you know you have a lot of facebook friends you have a lot of linkedin connections surely that can help and it can but those connections are still fairly loose compared to an actual friend so it would still take time to figure out who's the right fit, whose interests and goals align with what you want, who's actually interested in joining, and all those things. So that is why looking at it from an online perspective brings a lot of benefits. We can formulate the problem as, or we can set it up so that the host, you know, the person hosting the party or hosting the study group, they set up the attributes of the group. They say things about the party like what type of music is going to be there, what type of drinks are going to be available, if there are any alcoholic drinks. And then they, if it's private, can allow interested people to join or attend. And then on the user side, they can set their preferences, what they're looking for. They can then see recommended groups that they can then ask to join. And this versus the more traditional and normal way of doing things expands the pool of potential people you can draw from and the suitability constraints we can enforce or optimize for improves the overall quality of the groups and people who are able to join those groups. It's also just overall quicker because you know, you're know you filtering through an app rather than having to reach out and hope people see the messages and all of that. So again, this ties back to Nicholas's company, Benzi. As I said before, it's a marketplace kind of social platform for events. And the setup is, at the time, was very similar to what I just described. You know, users can set their event preferences, ask to join the events, hosts create them, set the traits, allow them, etc. But the problem is the users and the hosts kind of have conflicting needs. The hosts want the best possible people while going through the least applications. And the users, they want to see the best possible groups. But there may be other people who are a better fit. And we don't want to overload the hosts. So we don't want people to see groups that they are unlikely to get in, even if it looks like it's a perfect match for them. So it kind of becomes a situation of how do we balance the best users for a group versus the best groups for a user. The solution also needs to be very scalable and practical because our 
setup or our system is going to be changing very, very frequently. Users are going to be changing their preferences. New hosts are going to be joining. The groups and events are going to be changing. So that element of the scalability needs to be uh, a very important consideration. Uh, the first type of um, existing solution or route that comes to mind, or at least for me, was dating apps. And even though a lot of the work or actual systems that are used here are typically held proprietarily, at a high level, we can still compare and, and see that with dating apps, the priority is one-to-one -one matchmaking, obviously. And while that's still important or useful for us to look at, it still it doesn't consider half of what we're concerned with. It doesn't consider the groupings and managing the load of the hosts and all that stuff. So these, this is a, a, a nice entry point, but it isn't enough. And then on the other side, we have gaming lobbies where we do consider both the quality of the matches and the grouping side of it, but they, their solutions are shaped by their own intentions. They need to form the best groups very, very quickly to get people playing as fast as possible, to get the best experience for the players as fast as possible. And, the, and because of that, the users themselves often have very little control in the groups that they create. It's just usually random according to who wants to play at the time. If we focus more on the methods side of things, load balancing and especially combinatorial optimization has strong solutions for this type of problem that we have. The challenge comes in when we look at the change that we talked about before. How often would this need to run when we consider how frequently our system is changing? You know, we would much prefer to have a very good solution all the time than have the perfect solution sometimes. And that leads to our approach. We look at continually maintaining an approximate solution and we will do that by identifying what are the events that cause suboptimal changes in our system and what can we do to immediately rectify those changes. And by doing it this way as well, it makes it easier for us to have a serverless architecture that's event driven. And that ultimately simplifies our system, makes it easier to scale, and as a result, makes it cheaper. So to summarize the contributions that our paper talks about, well, we have a framework that balances the objectives of our group formation problem. We look at examples of applications where this framework can be useful. And we implement and evaluate that implementation using a simulated production environment. So for the framework itself, the first thing we need to do is define our variables. What is this? How do we define this system and how, what are we optimizing to make this system in line with our goals? And we call that overall system state a single value, the entropy. And the entropy is made up of two important variables, the users per group relative to the capacity of the group and the total difference and the preferences between a group and the users that see that recommendation. So I'll, I'll go into them with a bit more detail, but the two main things we're looking at here are the spread of users in terms of recommendations and groups and the quality of the matches within that spread. So for the users per group, this is important because let's say we have a group that can hold up to 20 people but like 200 people are a great match for it. And at the same time, what if we have a group that has 200 people possible, but only 20 people are looking at it? That doesn't really make sense. It just creates extra work for one group host and the other one kind of just has a poorer experience. So we would want to balance this by using a value called alpha. So if we look at one single group, Alpha would be the number of users seeing that group divided by the capacity of the group. And then we'll calculate the alpha value for the entire system by looking at the variance of all the alpha values across all groups. 
On the other side, when we're looking at the quality of the matches, this is a bit closer to the typical cost functions you'll see. And this is just about taking an average of all of the different features our system has. So every feature, we might want to calculate the difference between what a user wants and what a group or party will have in different ways. So let's say a feature is uh, distance. People want to find events or parties that are close to them. Then the distance cost function could look something like this over here, D over D plus one, so that the further away you are, the higher the cost, closer, lower the cost. And then we just take the average of these cost functions for all the features across the entire system to get a single value. So we have a single value for the alpha and a single value for the quality of matches. We add those two and that is how we represent the state of the system. Again, we're looking at the spread of users and the quality of the matches. So now, how does our framework actually go about uh, rectifying or optimizing for that state? Uh, like I said before, we're, we need to define what the suboptimal changes that can occur are. And we focus on them separately. So here we first address balancing that alpha value, making sure a fair amount of people are seeing each group. And then separately, we'll address the quality of the matches. So with regards to balancing the alpha, uh, these are the five events or suboptimal changes that can occur. For example, if a new user joins, then our rectifying change would be, we'll show that person the groups that need people. Now, it's important to note that their initial experience won't really be affected here because as you'll see, we immediately handle the matchmaking quality afterwards. This is just about making sure uh, are the right or ideal number of people are seeing the groups. It's only about the number here. And then immediately after that, we run something called the bubble function. This is what's focused on improving matching, matchmaking quality. And it, this, it does this by searching a user's recommended groups for the best swap with a user that's seeing another group. So for example, let's say user one is seeing group one and user two is seeing group four. These are the values representing the quality of the match. But if we swap those two users, even though user one sees a worse match, user two sees a much, much better one. So the net difference is, is better for the overall system, which makes it a good swap. And the bubble function would make those swaps for the good of the overall system. Uh, this is, uh, you know, this can be a very heavy function depending on the number of people in the system. So we also implemented a way to run it on a trimmed set. So for example, only the closest 100 groups to the person or to the new user, for example. Uh, so we then implemented that entire framework using Firebase Cloud Functions and Firestore, and we implemented a testing app for evaluation using Flutter. So each of the uh, events and the bubble function we just went through would have had their own cloud function and um, all of the data would have been held in Firestore. As for simulating a production environment, we use the Facebook 100 data set. So this is a data set of people and different features regarding their universities and high schools and that kind of stuff. So we just use those arbitrary features selecting the most normal looking ones to represent users, groups, and more party-like features. To give those people and events locations, we use the Tweet Geolocation 5M dataset. So those are just you know, long and lat values that we assign randomly. The testing app, this is what it looked like. It was basically just for driving our simulations so that we can evaluate our framework. So you could do something like adding a single user, creating a single event, or you know, doing it more at scale, adding a thousand people over time, or creating tons of groups over time. And that that then enabled us um, and enabled our ability to do our experiments. 
So this one was about looking at the ability of our framework to improve or maintain a good steady state. So we would have run um, suboptimal changes, so new groups, new people, closing groups, that kind of stuff. And you can see the state of the system would have gotten worse every time those changes were made. And then as the rectifying functions were run in response, it would immediately improve. So it, it shows that our framework does exactly what we intended it to do, maintain an approximately good solution as change occurs. But this is optimizing for variables and a state that we defined. So we also thought it was useful in another experiment or a set of experiments to take another perspective of what we're trying to do. So this graph here is, is the users, their values for a single feature against that feature for the group they're seeing. So if this on the user side is, uh, I don't know, no alcohol, then on the group side, it would be whatever that group host put. And, and initially it's kind of all over the place. People are just in an almost random assortment. And then in the final, after running all of our functions and simulations, you can see it's, it's a lot closer to a linear correlation. People are in groups that better match the features that they have or the preferences that they have. Some people are still kind of overflowed. That's because, you know, even though this might be a darker color, we don't know the actual cap of that group. If everyone is saying not everyone can be in that spot, you know. Uh, as I mentioned before, combinatorial optimization solutions can get us the perfect result or system. So we defined the problem also as a network flow problem in order to get the absolute best solution. So we, we implemented this in Julia using jump and a CBC solver so that we can compare how well our framework does against the you know, perfect answer. Um, over our runs, they weren't that far off, but it's important to note that our framework can get stuck in a local optimal. So even if it didn't happen in these runs, it's possible that with a larger amount of users or at some other point in time, this distance or the difference here can be bigger than what we see. In terms of other applications, you know, the, the party stuff was the main motivation, but it can be more general than that. Um, an example that we often kept in mind was study groups. So if you're in a class for a particular subject, you know, there you will have classmates, but they may, they may not be the ideal people for you to study with because they may have completely different learning styles, completely different personality traits, completely different comfort in the subject. You, you may just not like them. So by doing this type of solution for this as well, you can find a better group of people that match what you're looking for. So say, for example, a German student is studying in an English-speaking school. If they can study the exact same subject with people that know their native language, they may enjoy it a lot more. Similarly, for recruitment and gaming teams, the, the core thing stays the same. The only thing that changes is the features that you would use. So that's what makes this type of framework a lot more general than the, just the motivating idea we had. In terms of future work or routes for improvements, uh, we think it can be useful to implement for a single use case and get the feedback of real people on how effective or useful this is for that. Another option is to improve the simulation by making it more realistic, looking at the growth curves, the churn rate, that kind of stuff. Um, Another important aspect when it comes to forming groups, especially for in-person events and parties is trust. You know, these features that we've defined or that will be defined for a particular use case are, are great, they're helpful, they're useful. But if you know someone that's going to an event, a mutual friend, that would probably change how much you consider certain features. So looking at the inclusion of trust into this framework is also another important step.
uh, Shiva and Prof did work in this area as well. So that exactly what they did would be a good fit to go into this. Um, the bubble function that we talked about is a very important part of this framework, but it, right now it's it's you know it's kind of a direct way of going about things, you know, greedy. So if we could also look at integrating the network flow part of it, maybe at a smaller scale, just to make it easier to work continually, that can also possibly um, improve the results that we have. And lastly, like I guess I didn't write it here, but uh, making this entire framework a lot more usable for use cases. So like a, a simple or easy to use library or tool to make it easier to implement in real cases would also be a, a very big step forward for this type of thing. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Thanks for listening. Uh, that's it. Do you have any questions? Yeah, th thanks. Uh, thanks, Rishon. Uh, <clears throat> just uh, to give an update on, on this particular app, uh, it will actually be launched uh, later this month, I believe, in, in Miami. Um, there was a beta version. And so Nicholas was able to collect some initial um, data um, to see some of the issues and, you know, like payment, et cetera. Um, you know, um, the mix of genders that, you know, stuff like that has to be um, balanced, et cetera. So uh, we'll see what happens, but um, nice presentation, Rishon. So uh, questions, yes, uh, Nicholas, you have a question? Uh, yeah, uh, I really like the presentation, uh, Rishon. I uh, was nice. wondering, in the spirit of generalizing for other use cases, if I understand the bubble, the bubble function, um, it kind of trades off the group quality to try to optimize the experience for everybody. Yeah. Is that yeah. correct? So I'm wondering, maybe there'd be something useful to parameterize that like as a strategy. So you have it in bubble mode, there will be compromised that way. Or maybe it will um, allow the user to specify another mode where Hello. That it won't make the compromise and it will get about the people because maybe there may be use cases. I don't know what, what your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think that's a good idea, especially since uh, if you're kind of just starting off and you don't have that many users or it you in your particular use case, the change isn't that frequent, that kind of option would make it a lot more user friendly. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a good idea. Thanks. Oh, yeah, Nirvan? Hey, yeah, I have, I guess, one question right now. Um, so yeah, it was a real good presentation. I like the, the slides. <laughs> Fancy. Um, in regards to the implementation and tying it back to the evaluation. So you said in the evaluation stage, you guys use Firebase. Um, in terms of scaling it, as you, you guys go out to launch, is the data storage still going to be Firebase or is it going to be something more like a relational database that may perhaps be more efficient depending on how different functions are created? So the Firebase stuff we used as a prototype and at the time we used it because we, we tried to stay as close as possible to what uh, the real product would be, but I also haven't been involved since that point, so I don't know what he stuck to or what he kept using for the uh, the real product itself. We use um, the Firebase emulator to get as much simulations done without actually paying for all of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I would have to check with him, uh, Nirvan, but I, I believe they, they still use uh, Firebase, but um, I'm not sure. You know, it could be because the, you know, once they start ramping up and scaling up, they may have to migrate, but um, yeah, not not sure. Yeah, uh, okay. Yeah, Thanks. BigQuery, BigQuery and Firebase also 
play well with each other. So BigQuery might be an option as well. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah, I'll mention that to him. Any, any um, other question? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. In, re in regards to the bubble function, um, mm -hmm. when do you guys know to run that? Is it based on time or is it based on an event or something? Yeah. So uh, the same events that we balance users for, those are basically the main suboptimal events that can occur. So after each of these events happen, we'll run these individual functions to handle balancing the number of users, and then we'll immediately run the bubble function as well. So, so the bubble function runs after all of these as well. All right, okay. Thank you.